as I read this book, I thought back to when I was a boy in a one-room school in Ontario. Um, and we lived in a, a, a very small village. We lived about a quarter of a mile down the road, and about a mile down the road uh, were three boys that I went to school with. Um, Billy Fluter, uh, to put it in the vernacular, was a bugger. He had, um, he had it in for me. He was a farmer's son, he was strong, he, he was tough, and he thought I was a nerd and an absolute wimp. And so on the way home, he would prove this uh, as often as he could by beating me and pummeling me and um, leaving me in the ditch. So I came to believe in my youthful mind that Billy Fluter was evil incarnate. And so I encountered evil uh, very early. And I grew up in a very, um, I would call it religious, Christian religious home in which evil was uh, often cited as one of the problems in the world. And so I had the language and the narration that provided me with an identification for Billy Fluter. Unfortunately, that's not the end of the story. Uh, because every time that Billy Fluter beat me up, I would go home and I would tell my mother, you know, I wish that guy were dead. He is, he's absolutely evil. As far as I'm concerned, I'd like to see him dead. Two weeks later, he was. Um, he, and his, he and his family were on their way to church in Hamilton, and they went up over the rise of the hill, and a car was passing, and there was a head-on collision, and Billy Fluter went right through the windshield, and that was the end of Billy Fluter. Well, that wasn't the end of it for me, and I think you can see the problem that I had to face then, because the school, of course, uh, had a memorial service, and, and the school had to remember Billy Fluter. And I was torn. On the one hand, I didn't know whether <laughs> I had some kind of magic uh, that said, well, uh, you know, Billy Fluter, I want Billy Fluter dead, <laughs> and it happened. And, and that kind of threw me into a loop. And then on the other hand, I had to admit that I kind of felt sorry for him. That, you know, if in fact I had had something to do with doing him in, that I really hadn't meant it that way. That really all I wanted him to do was to get a broken arm or something so he couldn't beat me up. That's about all I wanted to do. But So when I used the kind of murder language and all that stuff, it was more, you know, um, back uh, breast pounding and that kind of stuff. But that wasn't the end of it then because, you see, even though I, I felt empathetic, we had to meet with the parents. And the parents were devastated, obviously, right? I mean, a, a son like this you don't get very often. And here was two people whose world had just collapsed. And I felt complicit. I tell you this story because when I read uh, what Simon had to say, I didn't know whether he was speaking tongue-in-cheek or whether this was a genuine piece of work. Because, you see, empathy is not something that you can just find sitting alone by itself. 
Nor, nor do I think you find evil sitting alone by itself that you can, you know, hone in on it. Now, I know we always use Hitler and the Holocaust and, and things like that as primary examples of evil. But, you know, there are people who even see Hitler in some kind of context. And, and when you do that kind of thing, then you see how messy this whole area becomes. So when I see the science of evil, it, I'm, I'm, the first thing I think of is, well, I don't believe this at all. I just don't believe it. So you have to understand that I'm coming at this book with a big, huge gob of doubt, right, right from the word go, because my own experience of empathy and evil is a rather convoluted and difficult one. And so to, to argue that you can move from one thing into the other is, um, you know, for me, just a bit much.